Hello and welcome back to Third Culture Africans. I'm Zeze, your host and the voice behind Third Culture Africans. Welcome to a space where culture, success and inspiring journeys collide. Whether you're a dream chaser, a culture enthusiast or just looking for your daily dose of inspiration, you're in the right place. And welcome to another episode of Third Culture Africans. Uh, This time, the show is being filmed and recorded in my hometown or my motherland, Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I'm super excited to be recording this episode, especially in Nigeria on the continent, um, because for the last three seasons, including most of this season, we have recorded everywhere else but on the continent. Um, So this is a huge day for the team at Third Culture Africans and also a a great chance for us to bring the show home and to start growing our roots further further afield than the diaspora, but also connecting um, our Africans across the globe on African soil. Um, I started the show just before the pandemic, and it was really a labor of love and a conversation uh, for my friends and I to have. That's kind of evolved now into what the show is. Um, so I'd like to start off with thanking our partners on, on this episode and many others. So I'd love to thank My Muse so on Vodacom Africa. You can listen to the show. Also, Kissa Art Collector Series for making this episode happen. And the Polo Club, the legendary Lagos Polo Club, which we are looking over at the moment. Um, so we can see the heat, but we are not in it. <laughs> and if we're lucky, we might get some riders out while we, while we take the episode. So it's uh, pretty special. The goal of Third Culture Africans really was about rewriting the narrative of African success. For many years as an entrepreneur, I couldn't find a reference point for people who had done it before me that looked like me and who had similar struggles to me. I realized that there was something happening in global culture that was positive and transformative. And so I thought, what if we could foster understanding of our narratives, of our stories, and of of our people, and the reasons why we create. Inspiring positive change, bridging gaps, and breaking down barriers. Podcasts are one of the fastest growing mediums in the world, and everyone can connect to a story from anywhere in the world. And I thought, why not start telling African stories? African storytelling is an art, from percussion instruments, masks, and costumes, to entertaining while people tell their stories, folk tales, folk, folk tales, fairy tales, and fables, and art. This is a part of our heritage and a part of our story. Before we dive into this episode, where we're going to be talking about how we inspire positive change, we talk about storytelling in all its forms and how you can use storytelling in your everyday life. I would love to introduce, and I'm proud to introduce, an amazing guest who is all the way from America, sitting in Lagos with me. The last time she was on Nigerian soil was in 1977, during the FESAC. Um, and I would love to introduce Shailene Quails, who has made the art of storytelling her life's work. Thank you so much, Seze. I'm so happy to be here. Um, yes, my name is Shalene Qual, and I'm um, CEO and founder of Art Beyond Entertainment and Art Beyond Productions, and based in San Francisco. And I'm really thrilled to be in Nigeria as a co-host and organizer with the Kisa Art Collective Series in Nigeria. During the 80s and 90s, I toured the uh, country and internationally with a one-woman show of poetry and stories called The Last Word. And uh, today I want to share with you a short version of my story of stories. Mm -hmm. 
So in 1970, I co-founded the Cleo Parker Robinson Dance Ensemble, and uh, which today is one of the world's foremost modern dance companies. And for a decade, I co-directed the administration of the company and performed in all of the concerts. And I'm really happy that Cleo Parker Robinson is here in Nigeria with us as we mm -hmm. speak. So in 1977, our company was really thrilled to be part of a 300 member delegation selected to represent the United States at a festival held in Lagos, it's called officially, the Second World Black and African Festival Arts and Culture, or FESTAC for short, which brought together 20,000 artists of African descent from all over the world, from 55 nations, in fact, artists and scholars. Um, FESTAC was the biggest cultural event to be held in Africa in the 20th century, and it was the largest reunion of African people that has taken place since the first slave ships left Africa in 1440. Um, so for one month, we lived together in this huge living-style village complex that the Nigerian government built for us, and for that one month, we sang together, ate together, danced together, shared our art, our culture, and our ways of life with each other. It was an incredible experience of self-discovery. And for the first three days, I remember, I didn't go to bed. Mm -hmm. I just went from like one delegation to the other, and I felt like I was walking across the continent of Africa. The most significant event took place on the day of the opening ceremony of the festival. We'd already been there for a few days, and when we all, you know, walked into a stadium built for 60,000 people, but was packed with 80,000 people that day, um, it was the largest grouping of Black people that I had ever seen. And it was just transformative, just being there and being in the crowd. However, somehow the wires had gotten crossed. And the American delegation had not been told that we were supposed to be a part of the opening ceremony. So we thought we were just coming to the stadium to watch the opening ceremony. And when we got there and saw all the other artists surrounding the stadium in national costumes, rehearsing dances and songs and with instruments that they were going to perform when they went into the stadium. So we were just a typical bunch of Americans. We were dressed every way you can imagine. We had on shorts, we had on you know, we had African clothing, we had no jeans, uh, we had no national song, no national dances, no instruments. We thought, oh my God, we need to get back home with us. <laughs> so anyway, um, but, um, you know, we couldn't, so we were there. So finally, when our, our turn to march into the stadium, which was at the end, because the United States of America used it for the end, um, what happened once we walked, um, into it was something that we completely did not expect. Uh, tens of thousands of mostly Nigerians in that, in that arena um, stood up and started, started shouting, welcome home and we love you. Amazing. We instantly, the 300 of us, tears were pouring down from our faces. Mm. And that we cried the entire way around that stadium. Mm. And we just knew that, you know, we are home. Mm. We are in Africa. And um, it, was, it was something that we also realized that the few of us were receiving a welcome that was meant for every single African-American at home. So here's a poem I wrote. So here we are, black people, who've been scattered throughout the world, our African bodies and souls far removed from our native continents green, planted along the waters to hang with new birds, flowers, animals, and people. We were taken to Cuba, Brazil, Haiti, Barbados, the Bahamas, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Martinique, Guadeloupe, the Virgin Islands, St. Lucia, Curaçao, Brazil, Panama, Peru, Mexico, America. Our hearts full of feelings, speaking languages unknown. 
our minds darkened with moonlight dreams of angel women and golden king men who slept to stars and walked to sun's light. Whatever the name of our new strange land, our ancestor seeds sprouted through our common experiences and suffering. Our blues, gospel music, ska, bookamania, nighttime, love, music all flowed together. And it was in the name of a white only God and unmighty dollars that we were told we were nothing. But the truth flies open under the stars of this night. Minds free and clear with sun setting. Love gets another chance. We understand now exactly who we are to want to dance freely in the warm rhythm of the sun. Who we are to twist in hurricane circles gathering our people as we spiral up. Who we are to tell the world to let us live the dreams our hearts drum so that we may have the sight to see our children's souls and bless them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think we've ever had an episode like this. So um, to anyone listening, run to those comments. Give us those five stars because this is probably the best episode you're getting this season. Um, along with this episode, um, we as a team decided that we want to put our mouths where our action is. And we spent the last, I would say, 53 episodes bringing the stories of entrepreneurs across the globe of African heritage into your ears while you go on your walk, into your living rooms and wherever else you listen to the show. And one of the things that struck me was the power of storytelling and how that has been a force for change. And very few people understand how storytelling, one, works, but two, what it can do in your daily lives. Knowledge gap is probably one of the biggest issues we face as a continent and even as a people across the globe. And so Third Culture Africans hopes to continue to bridge that gap and bring digestible content. And so we've launched our ebook, Unveiling Success, The Art of Storytelling, which you can get for free. It includes some exercises. And I'd love to read an excerpt from the ebook before I introduce our two guests who have also made their life's work around storytelling. Stories have always been the heartbeat of African culture. Passed down from generation to generation, they've preserved our traditions, articulated our dreams, and conveyed our aspirations. In this chapter, or in this book, when you get it, we explore the rich heritage of storytelling in African culture and how it continues to bind us together, even in the fast-paced digital age. In an era dominated by technology and digital distractions, the art of storytelling remains a timeless and profoundly vital tradition. Storytelling has been intrinsic to human culture for millennia, serving as a medium for preserving heritage, imparting wisdom, and connecting people across generations. African storytelling in particular has a rich and diverse tapestry that continues to captivate the world. Despite the prolification of digital content, the importance of storytelling in the modern age cannot be overstated. And on that note, I would love to introduce our first guest on this week's episode. She needs very little introduction because I think last time I checked, she probably has one of the largest African shows on Netflix, targeted at the African millennial woman. And that is none other than a good friend of mine who was also on season one, Arise Ugu, the smart money woman herself. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, friend. <laughs> um, 
my next guest needs also no introduction purely because I think anyone, and it wasn't intentional for this to be all about women, um, but I think in the narrative of African storytelling, I think women have played a huge part in shaping our history and how we see ourselves. Those stories that get told to you at bath time or at bedtime have all fostered the creation and the imagination in all of our minds. My next guest is the founding member and chair of African Women on Board and currently sits on the board of Relay Gallery and Girly Essentials. She has a doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley, a master's from the University College London. She went to school, Cher. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty school. <laughs> a law degree from the University of Manchester and has been called to the bar in England, Nigeria, and New York. She is none other than Inkiru Balonwu. So if so, that's how you know that I can give you that bio. So yeah, because I would never give that. I'm just Inkiru, and I'm actually here um, representing Africa Soft Power yes, as we'll opposed talk to about African that. Women on Board. We'll but that. you know, um, I think the point is, I believe that women and young people are um, Africa's biggest opportunity and we haven't done anything about those two um, demographics so that's you know, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are going to get to soft power. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's at least get them hooked in on the episode. So by the time they hear all the books you've read, they'll know that oh, yeah. uh, you're going to talk. Don't offer me champagne until you see that there's a problem. <laughs> we're, good, we're good hosts. We're good hosts. This, this is what the show is about. Trust me, someone is probably drinking a glass of something while they're listening to this episode. So we're in the right mood. Um, I think starting off with an episode where we have three strong women. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, both of you have worked incredibly hard in shaping the narrative, so to speak, whether that's the narrative of being African the narrative of being a woman and the narrative of being an African woman today and also the narrative of being African in general in a world that is connected so much so by technology. I would say I think for you, everyone knows a uh, smart money woman eagerly awaiting season two. <laughs> um, you probably wanted to brick Netflix when you release the when you release the season and it was very important for you to have the show go out on a platform like that i remember us having many conversations but i would love to invite i guess you to hopefully share why it was so important to have the show air on a free platform um <clears throat> so this whole thing started by accident um I had gone through like a divorce and personal challenges myself. And I basically started thinking, who's talking to women like me about the financial challenges that you go through when, you know, you go through those hard things. So I started thinking, if I wrote a book, what does that look like? Do, is it financial literacy 101? Is it an ABC thing? Is it, you know, boring or is it interesting? And, I like stories. I grew up reading like a lot of books and <laughs> watching a lot of movies. And I wanted to write something that I would read. So it started out as a book, a story of five African girls, their pain points when it came to money, business, all of that, love, family. And it had small money lessons at the end of each chapter. Mm -hmm. Luckily, people really fell in love with it because and this is why storytelling is powerful because finance is something that's boring. Usually people don't love it, but people fell in love with these characters because they could see themselves in the stories. They could see their friends in the stories. And then it's coming on a platform like Netflix made it so much bigger because I had writ written the book, gone on a book tour to several African countries. And then people started saying, I could totally see this as a movie. I could totally see this as um, a movie and then we started developing it and it first went on Africa magic and then we put it um, 
you know, on Netflix, or we fought <laughs> to put it on Netflix. Believe it or not, with the success that it had, um, the first time they rejected it, they said, sorry, we don't think that this is going to do well, like, um, commercially, because people are not going to be that interested in a book <laughs> that is about financial literacy, but they were wrong. Um, so it's, it's important for us to tell the stories that we want to see, um, told and to try to get them as, on as big platforms as we can. Thank you. Um, and here, let's jump into Africa Soft Power. And I guess for you, like Arise, it was having the conversations or most importantly, the African perspective in global conversations that was important. What was the inspiration behind you coming up with Africa soft power, most importantly? Um, thanks. So before I talk about Africa soft power, I just wanted to say, well, I didn't like to look at I just think it's really important that we give you know, praise and credit to women who are doing phenomenal things. So to you as well. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, but I want to say the, the whole idea, and I, I know that I'm supposed to go out that of mine, <laughs> but I just thought it was really important to talk about financial literacy and um, why it's so important for us as women. So, I mean, I have a doctorate, as uh, um, has been said, but I realized for a long time that I'm actually not financially literate or as literate as I could be. And so um, it's one of the most important. So when people are talking about the lock, the lock, the lock of issues, it's usually a focus on financial inclusion, which is really, really important. I'm sorry to be, because I know you want to talk about ASB, yeah. but I want to talk about you and your work. Mm -hmm. It's really important. But I think most women around the world, and particularly black women, are actually not, some people are included, but even the most educated women are not literate. So when you compare us to men who are just our peers, we don't know Jack. Mm. And so we're not building, we're not investing, we're not, you know, our money is not growing. And I think maybe it goes to the root, I always say, because I've done some work on financial literacy, that it goes to how we were raised as women and as black women mm. and as African women, that, you know, you get the, you know, the, 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 your money is for buying things, you know, little, little things here and there. And you're supposed to get married to this rich guy who's going to take care of all your needs and all of that stuff. And then forgetting that things happen. So maybe you don't get married to your rich Maybe you don't do this. Maybe, I know, sorry, this is, I'm going off. But I thought it was really important to celebrate the work on financial literacy and why it's so, so important that we get literate. I think the reason that Africans are when we're way behind is not because we're not, you know, we're just not, we don't understand money. And even this whole conversation around women equality, women mm -hmm. equity, all of that stuff, has a lot to do with finances. There's no problem if you have money. Men respect you if you have money. Nobody's going to beat you if you have money. So it's really, like, I think, such a critical issue. And so I don't want to sort of like say, oh, Africa's so past that, because this for me is one of the most important things of our time. We need to be you know, financially literate. We need to understand money. We need to understand the power of money, even as Africans. And now going to soft power. The reason that the continent is where it is is because money. You know, the reason America is where it is because it's money. So it literally all boils down to money. So as Africans, as Nigerians, as black people, it's really about commercial dollars. And so that's why, I mean, again, sort of like celebrating you on great, you know, great work that you're doing and thanks for all of that stuff. Thank for you. ASB, um, um, we started Africa Sapa during the pandemic. Um, as, um, so I, I did go to Berkeley. Um, and in terms of soft power, so I, when I, the first time I got to um, California, um, I, you know, I grew up with the American dream. And if you're like, oh, you know, like I wanted to be American, Nigeria was, you know, like, yeah, well, you know how we all grew up. Mm -hmm. I don't know about how, how old everybody in the room is, but we grew up with American accents. One, 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 one. So, <laughs> we wanted so badly to be American. Like, you know, like that was the thing. You know, like if you were American, you know, so MTV or one, everybody had an American accent. Even we had never left the country. So that was us. And so I, when I went to California the first time, I happened to land uh, at Berkeley and I didn't land in a nice area. I, I, I got to the space and it was like the student hostel type area. And I was like, there was weed, I could smell weed everywhere. And I'm like, what the 
hell, this is America. What? <laughs> you know, and you know how, like, you know, when you come to Nigeria, you're like, you know how Nigeria is. But the America I knew was everything was so like, you know, planes everywhere, things, everything was like high, high tech. And I got in the middle of the hood. Mm. And I'm like, but it was cool, it was fine. And it's just how Americans have always told the American story. So I grew up watching Hollywood movies. And every, you know, the soldiers, the American soldiers come and save everybody. And so America always wins. And then there's a, you know, even I use the American anthem, just literally, I just so wanted to be American. But what was the African dream? You know, what was that dream? Who, who are we? You know, how did we sell our stories? It was always stories, you know, all the horrible, horrible stories of poverty, of all of those things. Mm. Whereas there was so much poverty when I went to America. Like, when I, I was like, what? This is California? Cali- California! A whole California. And I was seeing all sorts of things I had never seen in my whole life. Because obviously I grew up a little crush, you know? And I was like, <laughs> this, is America. <laughs> this is America. And yet they sold the story of, you know, all this amazingness. Mm. And I'm like, why are we as Africans not selling the story of amazingness? Look at mm. the, look at, look at, look at, follow club, look at this, look at Look at that, it's beautiful. You know, we have so much amazingness. There's great things everywhere, there's horrible things everywhere. And so how can we tell those stories? And so during COVID, um, uh, and I'd written my thesis at um, Berkeley was about um, Nollywood and the power of storytelling. Is art imitating life or life imitating art? Mm. And so what time has COVID? When Netflix, as we're talking about Netflix, Netflix was everywhere. It was like about you know, the, the wars, the tech wars, you know, content wars. And all we had was content. And I was like, this is the time for Africa's of power. Mm. And what are we as Africans proud of? How are we celebrating ourselves? How are we celebrating our music, our mm. fashion, our, you know, everything about our hair, mm. you, know, you know, color, skin, all of those things. And that's how Africa's of power started. Amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you. See, see all those books that she read. It's working. It's working. <laughs> um, numerous studies in the field of psychology have shown that when learning through storytelling, the human brain is more engaged. A well-told story activates multiple brain regions, making it more memorable and emotionally resonant. One well-known example is Paul J. Zach's study, which shows that when people are immersed in a compelling story, the release of oxytocin, a hormone associated with bonding and empathy, increases. Um, This question's for you, Arise, uh, because I see sometimes when you post on (laughs) on Instagram uh, people's reactions. I think people now don't even know your name. (laughs) You're now the smart money woman um, because of the books and, and the show. But if you could talk about how the process for you of crafting those stories come about. Wow, it's a long, boring story. <laughs> but um, I wanted to speak a little bit about what you talked about, about the African soft power, because it's part of my process as well. Um, I think it's so important for us to start celebrating what is great about Lagos. One of my favorite things, um about the feedback that i get when people watch the show on netflix is especially from non-africans or sorry non-nigerians is oh my god lagos looks so beautiful i was there like why are you lying (laughs) because i've been here and it doesn't look anything as beautiful as this but i realized something in our stories a lot of nollywood stories are always talking about the bad it's always highlighting how corrupt we are, how evil we are, like all the ills of society. But we don't celebrate our culture. We don't celebrate our food. We don't celebrate our music as much as, you know, Hollywood does. Like you said, people don't know that there's homelessness on Skid Row because L.A. is selling a glamorous, you know, lifestyle. People don't know how dirty Paris is because Paris is selling, you know, romance. So, and I know this is a bit of a controversial thing to say, but I feel like Nigerians are the new colonizers. Mm. We are colonizing people all over the world. People want to eat our food. They want to, um, they want to listen to our music. They want to be like us. 
And I think it's something that we need to celebrate more and, you know, tell those stories more. So for me, in my storytelling, it's really important to create characters that I think are not generally seen in Nollywood movies. I liked it when people who are similar to me or had similar backgrounds to me watched the movie and they were like, Arisa, I finally feel seen. Mm. Like, this feels like my life. <laughs> like, this feels like something that would, you know, happen to me, mm. um, like, in terms of, like, the story and all of that. Mm. These are the places I would hang out. This is what my life kind of looks like. So I think it's important for, for us to start telling those stories that are not typ- typically told mm. to instead of this story of like poverty and you know women or or a country that's you know poor or looking at women in a very one dimensional way as opposed to complicated characters who yes you're a businesswoman but you're also a daddy's girl is complicated and i like that my characters basically just kind of reflect that Amazing. Helping you be smart with your money and finances is something we take pride in at Third Culture Africans. That's why we've partnered with Critco, UK's number one cashback platform, helping people to get something extra every time they shop online. With cashback earnings on over 5,000 brands, all you need to do is browse or search Critco for great cashback rates, huge discounts, and vouchers at all of your favorite brands and get a £15 new bonus credit when you join with our link. Earning cash back on your online shopping is easier than ever. Just hit the link below. Thank you. Um, I think I, I want to talk about the, the, the buzzword at the moment, authenticity. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially in the digital world. So. You know, this week is um, Art Week in Lagos. We have been immersed in a form of storytelling for most of the week, and it will be carrying on uh, for the rest of the week. But as Arise says, as the world starts to turn to pay attention to our version of storytelling, whether that's through art, through music, through our rituals, our traditions, our food, something that I have wondered is how much of this process is conscious in its authenticity because there's something about the storytelling that we as Africans do that is magnetic. I think in the 70s there was a similar gaze on our continent and that gaze was met with inspiring storytellers and creatives like Fela and so many creatives that were able to tell our stories. We're now in another version of that. And that's now about meeting an audience who's vocal, but also an audience that craves genuine, relatable content. And this question's for you, Nkiru. Around crafting our stories in an authentic way because we're we're highly influenced by what we see by what someone else has done um but as rsa pointed out if you look outside there's although polo club is nice i can't help but look at that building over there that has a crane (laughs) and the road that we drove down to reach this beautiful polo club and sit in this (laughs) ac room and the lights went nepa took lights as we were recording And these are all real things that happen within our stories. Um, What's your view in terms of crafting stories with with authenticity in mind? So I'd say that the word is actually, from my point of view, balanced. Um, And so if you just look look outside, there is that beautiful white building. And then if you look further down, you see like, you know, know, funny looking buildings. And then, yes, when we're coming in here, the, the potholes and um, you know um, what do you call it um, in Nigeria we say pot on top. I'll just say pot on top. Mud. That's that one. Yeah. Because I couldn't remember the English word. So there's pot on pot as we're well coming in. But then that doesn't then tell you that if you've gone the right way, um, they will have turned you back to say, oh, we're sort of like um, reconstructing. So they're putting a beautiful new game. And they're putting that you don't know that so if you've never been you would not have known that that existed 
So you see the potter potter, the mud, all of that stuff, which is true. It's a true story. But there's also that other true story. But the question, the issue I think is the balance, balance and storytelling. There's horrible things happening in Nigeria. Horrible, horrible, horrible things. It's horrible, horrible things happening everywhere in the world. Mm. Horrible, horrible things. So it's the balance. So when the media is telling <laughs> stories about us, it's always focused on the horrible, 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 horrible things. It doesn't say all of the great stuff. And there's great stuff happening here as well. Mm. And as we're everywhere else in the world. So that's the, the point of storytelling. It's mm. the balance of storytelling. We're not saying tell lies. Mm. We're saying balance. You know, create the, the same balance. New York Times uses to tell stories about New York. Mm. Or as Ronald was talking about Auckland, I used to live there. And I have heard since I left that, you know, people are, Auckland is the scariest place now because people are afraid of mm. their lives. And Ronald was telling me that, um, listen, when he was coming to Nigeria, and Fran said, you're going to Nigeria. And he said, but Auckland, you can't even go out. <laughs> you know? Again, it's balance. It's just balance. We're not, again, saying tell lies. We're just saying there's a balance in storytelling. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about a project that's close to our heart right mm -hmm. now, which is climate, climate change. Um, so at Africa South Park, part of what we do is, um, you know, we create um, stories around things that are um, important and, you know, uh, what the world is focusing on. And climate change is something that, you know, it's not a sexy topic, um, but we know that Africa is going to be the most impacted continent for many, many reasons. And then yet the word, when we're talking about climate change stories, we're talking about ice melting, you know, ice melting. How many Africans know ice? So I, I say that my mom, my mom's a lawyer, and when you talk about climate change, she's, she's, she's a lawyer and a farmer. And she doesn't connect the story, like, she's, that's not connected to her. Mm. But if you said erosion, she knows exactly when, she can tell you her farm, when you know, things are happening. And so we have to tell African stories the way Africans understand them. And then we become geniuses, mm. because we even have solutions. It's just that when the world is talking about us, it's very global north, very global north, you know, very, very, or oh, how things are done by, you know, the West. But we have solutions. It's just that we don't understand the, you know, the language that's being spoken. When we speak in our language, we can tell you, you know, answers from hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, back. And so that's why storytelling and balancing that storytelling is important. So climate change is a critical issue for how are Africans engaging. Yeah. So it's on us to tell Africans you know, the stories or tell the story how Africans can engage with it. Yeah. So talk about deforestation, talk about erosion. Talk about you know um, um fires. Talk about like Chad melting, mm. and suddenly you, you every African will tell you their experience mm. of climate change. But when we're talking in the language of the global north, right? yeah. so that's why that balance is critical, mm. and that's why that it's really important that we create African thought leadership mm. in the spaces that are particularly important for our time, and you know. I can't speak enough about how the balance is important and how African thought leadership, black thought leadership is essential for any movement mm -hmm. um, as Africans for ourselves, for our people, mm -hmm. and just to be centered in you know things that are happening in the world. That book again. You're lubricated. <laughs> Um, you both have talked about um, gathering inspiration. Arise, you spoke about the inspiration for smart money coming from your life experiences. Um, in Kira, you've shared how you've come about doing the work that you do. Um, but most importantly, how stories influenced your, your view of you know, other places in the world. Now, we're in a space where everyone wants to be the finished product and we judge ourselves harshly as a result of that and for a non-author author a non-tv <laughs> producer producer <laughs> and a non any of those things but you are now then those things and and the same for you and Kiri, your, your you know first law all this you know everyone starts somewhere i think that's the point i'm trying to make and for anyone listening to this episode, I think I would love for both of you to share some advice on 
how to begin to storytell in your own unique way, but also the power of storytelling in the smallest way, shape or form. Because your, your story started small mm -hmm. in, in your mind, you know, uh, you, you came to, I'll let you tell the story actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you tell the story. Um, I think for me, it's really just about believing in yourself um, at every point. Because for me, it's not like I had this big plan and I knew exactly what I was going to do. But I always just followed the opportunity and paid attention to where, where my skill set was and applied it to the opportunities that I saw in front of me. Um, like you said, I'm an author that was basically like a non-author, a producer, a TV <laughs> producer that didn't go to film school. But I just had this mentality that I would figure it out, you know, one step at a time. With the book, it was like, okay, I could do this. I spent probably six months writing one chapter. But then when I figured out, like, how I was going to do it, like, um, it just flowed, you know, from there. With the film career, that was even crazier because... It was lit literally people DMing me or sending me emails and saying, oh my God, I wish this thing was a movie. I wish this thing was a series. I would totally watch it. And I'm thinking, you're crazy. You want me to go and sit down and create a whole movie from, from my book? Who is going to pay me for it? Like who, I don't know how to do this. But you know when something like sticks with you and you keep thinking, okay, if I was actually going to go through this process, what would that look like? And it basically started with me talking to different people who were directors or producers or writers and, you know, hearing what they had to say and basically creating a blueprint for myself mm -hmm. and following through. And even now, I'm still, even with season two, two books later, how many book tours later, um, I'm still figuring it out. Like the rules <laughs> get bigger or get different. I, you know, at every stage and you have to figure out how, you know, to go about it. But I think the key thing is believing in yourself, believing that you can do it and then you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say for me, most of my, so I, I used to run a music company. Mm. Um, I was going to get, I was going to yeah, get to that. <laughs> yeah, but um, I would say with African Women on Board, mm. which is our nonprofit, and, um, and Africa Sapa, I think most of my journey has been around frustration. Mm. Um, so, like, I've just generally been frustrated. Mm. Um, there's so many things that I, I, I do wonderfully well. I'm actually one of the most amazing cleaners mm. you would ever meet in your life. I, can, <laughs> I would be the best, I honestly, you would pay me, uh, I mean, a phenomenal cleaner. Mm. Um, but I also feel that um, there's just so many things that need to get done by us. And I feel like as Africans and as black people, we're like not propelling. So it's just really big frustration um, in terms of my work. Um, and then I, I think I grew up saying uh, or understanding from my parents and I think from everybody around that if you sweep if you sweep the front of your own yard, as they say, um, if you sweep if everybody swept the front of their own yard, then we would have a clean street. Mm -hmm. And so we have been failed, I think, by our leadership in many you know, as Africans, we've been failed generally. Um, I, I, I suppose as Black people, we've been failed as well. Um, and so, so what is your, um, what do you then do as an individual? What should you be doing? And I feel like, really, if we all swept the front of our own yard, like what can you do? What do you do well? And how do you channel that to sort of like impact the many? I feel like that's how I've been, um, that's how I'm programmed and how I've been programming. And so, um, to that point, it's like, I just like, okay, this is what drives me. That um, it is what is my constantly thinking, how can we, how can we, how can we impact? How can we make change? How can we pull together? How can we, and I feel like, uh, again, something that we should be looking at as Africans is collaboration. Mm -hmm. I feel like we do great things and we're all silos, so small, small things. Mm -hmm. So we start sweeping in front of our own yards. But then we then look at the power, you know, of when you then to like, you know, come together. Mm. And I just think about like, just look at what's going on in the world right now with the Israel-Palestinian mm. thing and how, you know, the Jews are able to 
move and buzz from anywhere in the world. Mm. Imagine if we as black people did mm. that. Mm. You know, like the power of diaspora, mm. it's so huge. But how are we inviting them? How are we connecting them? You know, that's sort of like the things that, you know, like there's so much we can do, but we're still thinking in silos. And if we think in like bigger, like blocks, I really think that there's power, that's where the power will come from. So those are the things that drive me. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so I think the conversation around embracing storytelling in our daily lives is what moves the average person and that that's what allows them to connect with it if you had to again and this is hard mm -hmm. if you had to say what was the one thing you did that in hindsight as now a storyteller because this is now your work what would you do differently what i do differently in terms of storytelling yeah in your journey yeah Nothing. Mm. Ah, nothing. Because wow. you see, every every <laughs> every mistake, every um, misstep, every single thing that I have experienced is what has gotten me exactly here. Mm. Writing my book came from a personal struggle, mm. um, and you know, being open about that, being creating stories around other personal struggles that other African women, you know, face connected with people in a very, very real way. And it connected with people in a way that they wanted to change their own lives, where one of the most fulfilling things for me is people sending me emails or DMs or meeting me in the supermarket and saying, because of the book, I started a stock portfolio or I bought land or I started budgeting <laughs> you know, better. <laughs> what is more incredible than that? Like, mm. I, I would change none of it. Mm. Every single struggle that I've experienced has gotten me exactly here. It has made me more aware of my own strength because mm. I feel like with everything that you face or you're forced to face, mm. you develop new skills. Mm. You, de you develop new strengths. Um, so I would I wouldn't take anything away from that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, speaking of smart money moves, um, in Kira, you touched on um, one of your businesses, Spinlet, um, which was the music streaming app that had over two million subscribers at one point. Um, you've also been a lecturer. <laughs> Let's keep going now. <laughs> This is the point of the show. We're supposed to be giving you your flowers. Um, but you also created an app called Bookkeeper, um, which helps simplify accountancy and cash flow management for individuals and small businesses. A lot of your work has been around empowerment and bridging the gap for the average person. Now, in your story, how much of that journey for you has been about vulnerability because Arisa has just spoken about her storytelling has an element of vulnerability. Um, and I would love to hear your take on being vulnerable within storytelling. Clearly, that's a really old buy. Where did you get that? <laughs> it's all here. I have, a, I have all of it. That's <laughs> what that thing is taking. This is why you shouldn't be stuck in storytelling. I think everything in terms of my work has mm. been from experience and mm. frustration, as I say. So, Bookkeeper, I remember when I was starting my first, um, so when I was at Spinnet, I used mm. to run a music company, which was the, um, it was called the iTunes of Africa at the time. Mm. And we were way ahead of, you know, way, way ahead of a portfolio company of a, um, of a PE firm. Um, we're moving on from that. So, when I was starting my company, um, which is a consulting strategy company. Um, my biggest issue is actually um, bookkeeping, um, money, really, and just what, that's why financial literacy is so important to me. So I, I remember that I could tell, let's use Naira, so you have a million Naira, I could tell where 900,000 Naira of it went to. But the 100,000 Naira 
like you spend, you know, like you spend ten thousand naira here, five thousand naira here. So let's say you spend a hundred dollars here, two hundred dollars there. I could never balance my books. Um, just because I was not, you know, I mean, I had some, I was like everything to my, you know, like, well, the CEO of everything, chief everything officer. So I was doing everything, I was running around, and I was like, how is this, how is this surviving? Because I couldn't actually make my books meet. I just couldn't tell where the last, you know, that last hundred dollars went to. And as a business, that just wasn't, you know, you couldn't run a business that way. And that's how I started Bookkeeper, which was like an app to sort of like trace, track every single dollar, every single penny spent. Um, um, because it was a need basis. With African women on board, it was frustration. You know, um, I'm, a, you know, I, I'd left, I'd left, um, um, I, you know, salaried employment where I got paid pretty well to start a business. And I thought that it was very difficult. Um, running a business, um, uh, being the CEO, because I had all of these issues with, you know, like, you know, you go to a board presentation and some guy tells you all sorts of things. So I thought it was going to be like when you become your own um, 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 boss, mm. things would be so much better. You know, it actually was, mm. because then you're hustling. Mm. You know, as a boss, you're then looking for clients. Mm. And so you're going to have to sit there and take the BS. Mm. So someone's telling you, all sorts of shit. Sorry, excuse me. This is you know. Don't so, worry. It's, it's uh, over eighteen. You can curse. Okay. <laughs> so you get somebody telling you stuff, and you're like, "We well, can't say it." Because when I was employed and I had a salary, I could actually say things. Because at the end of the month, I'll get paid. But as my own boss, and I had people to pay, totally different. You really had to be more careful. And you know the things about women and you know, um, you know sexual harassment, all of those things. That's when it becomes intense. Mm. And you have to then be even more careful because you can't be as rude as you used to be before. Yeah. You know, before you could say, yeah. <laughs> now you're like, oh, so. <laughs> Deep breath. You know, Deep breath. You know, like, so really, I swear, my whole adult life, everything I've done has been from frustration. Mm. Or many of it has been from a place of frustration in terms mm. of navigating the situation mm. but also then understanding that um because it's complex mm. like there's ways to tell the story so like how do you tell the african story or these things are, which are really serious things what are the complexities what are the nuances mm. and that's what i'm sort of like you know you know interested in and empowered by because you know when when we talk about me too and you know the me too thing came from america and you're like the whole silicon valley this was happening it just means that things happen when there are no consequences. Mm. So when people say, oh, well, Africans are badly behaved, you're like, no, 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 no. We're mm. not. It's just when there are no consequences, people behave badly everywhere. Mm. And so that's just it. So those nuances of storytelling, and men are not worse than men anywhere. It's mm. just that there's rules. And if there are rules, she's saying, mm. I swear, it's rules, rules, rules. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, nah. <laughs> that one is debatable. I feel like Nigerian men are special. I don't think they're worse than men everywhere, but I think that Nigerian men are a very special breed. Let's just be honest. <laughs> I think every, I think, I think, not in a, not, I'm not saying in a good or a bad way, but I'm saying there is very The men in the audience are like, breed. say what? I think, I think. <laughs> Women from all like walks of life, whether they're from Uganda, South Africa, Ghana, they have stories to tell about a Nigerian no, man more than, <laughs> more than. Don't more than. This too, but don't ah, wait! I'm, I, give me the mic! Give me the mic! <laughs> give me. The reason I don't agree with that, or I agree and I don't agree, mm. is because well, think about divorce laws in America or anywhere else. Yeah, mm. if you mess up, they will take half your house. Yeah, or all of these things. If we have that rule here, you will say Nigerian men are perfect. Like, there are no consequences. You see, That's I'm not talking about bad behavior. Nigerian men don't have, general. like, the monopoly on bad behavior. I'm saying we have to acknowledge that Nigerian men have a special impact on women all over the world. Mm-hmm. Whether it's American, <laughs> whether, whether it's Ghanaian, ahead. Well, when you experience in happy. Nigeria, you're like, ah, what can we you say? Know, when you experience <laughs> in Nigeria, man, it's an experience. Now the men are like, ahead. This is what we want to hear. This is what we want to hear. Um, but, but to bring it back to our conversation around storytelling, I think, 
you know, this is one of those stories of our stories, right? Of our men, of our women, of our culture, of our food, of our hospitality, of our everything. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, and so this is the part of every episode where we do the quick fire questions, um, where no one has had time to plan. Um, and so, uh, for you, Arise, you have had publicity upon publicity. There's nowhere that your face, your story, wow. your, this hasn't been on. Let's be fair. Netflix is global, right? I guess. And you were number what? Well, number one for a few weeks. Number one for a few weeks. So it's kind of impossible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough one. How would you define success? When me, my family, and all my friends are winning. When everyone that I'm surrounded by is winning. Mm -hmm. That's how I would describe success. Okay, thank you. All those degrees, plenty. That's such a difficult question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like success, when I think about the thing I don't have any control over is being alive and being well. Mm -hmm. So that is an important part of success for me. It's like waking up in the morning and finding I'm in good health. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that. And then I think everything else is within our control in terms of how, um, I think it's just as we're getting, as one's getting older and I'm mm -hmm. encountering age and I'm like, ah. So success to me is, you know, having friends, mm -hmm. um, having family, but friends who are sort of like, you know, um, rooting for you, mm -hmm. but also just knowing that the glass is half full and that we can really, um, in the right frame of mind, and literally if we have good health, like that's to me the most important thing. Everything else we can then do we can. So for me, that's success as in like waking up and being like feeling angry. And my friend said it's only when you're alive that you have problems. Mm. So that's how I see it. <laughs> so uh, that's yeah. but I think that's also from being you know, getting older and like <laughs> Staring, yeah. amazing. Thank you. Um, last question to both of you. Uh, as now an author and a literal human, um, what are three book re recommendations you have for anyone who's listened to this episode and is considering storytelling and is looking for resources? We've got some in the ebook, but I'd love to hear um, three recommendations if you've got them. I have to say the smart money woman because I need those Amazon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please, Smart Money Woman on Amazon, um, dollar is dollaring, mm -hmm. um, but two of my favorite books are The Rich Are Different, it's by a woman called Susan Howitch, um, it's really old, my father read it, everybody in my household read it, mm -hmm. and it's one of those books that I read like multiple times, like a year, um, and what else would I recommend? That's it? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I wish you told me that. I was going to ask. I'm going to ask this. I haven't read a book in forever. I read every day, but not mm. really anymore. I would say my favorite book of all time is um, So Long a Letter. Mm. I don't know if anyone's read that book, but you should get it. It's the thinnest, it's this thin. Um, it literally, I think it's, it's by um, some Gilles author, Miriam Abba. Um, but that, well, that book for me, a book that's similar is um, The Secret Lives of Babashe, um, Babashe's Wives or something, mm -hmm. I think. It's similar, similar, but not quite. But um, Miriam Abba's um, So Long a Letter for me, um, over time, is still my best, my favorite book. Like, you know, and obviously there's the beautiful ones that I've born and mm -hmm. you know, all of these books that we too much of those books that we read mm -hmm. as literature. Um, but that book as someone who sort of like identifies as strongly like, you know, for women, um, I think that book is like I, I, if you haven't read it, I recommend it to everybody. Um, it's I think it's a must read and it's very thin. It will take you more than two hours to read. So you should definitely um, it's a very old book, but you should definitely get it. Amazing. Where can everyone find you? The book. You. Oh, find you. See, that's the thing. I'm not actually on. I think my handle is 
handles and but well, no or something. I'm not. If you say anything on me on social media, it's not. We'll, we'll have it in the show notes. <laughs> we'll, we'll have it in the show notes. <laughs> you know? We'll have it in the show notes. Yeah, Kira, Africa, but honestly, I'm still not. <laughs> Take down that email address quick. <laughs> um Small money, Arise, on Instagram. Um, amazing we'll have all the details in the show notes um i would like to thank everyone today for being a part of this live recording i'd like to thank kissa art collector series for making this happen i would like to thank the lagos polo club for hosting us generously today i would also like to thank my lovely daughter who has managed to stay quiet for the whole hour of recording <laughs> Welcome, and who insisted that she wanted to be here um, and I'd like to thank all of you for making today special um, and I look forward to us talking getting to know each other and swapping stories and hopefully creating magic together until next week on Third Culture Africans I'm Zezo Ariaki Sao and I've been your host thank you if you've loved this episode or any of the episodes from Third Culture Africans, your support in making the show bigger will be much appreciated. Share it with a friend, comment on social media, join the newsletter community over at thirdcultureafricans.com or leave us a review where you're listening to the show. Thank you and until next time.